Hey and welcome to the mixing process. Today I want to revisit a topic I made a video on almost two years ago now regarding mixing with faders at zero. And if you haven't already seen that video, I'll link it in the description below. But the purpose of that video was to explain how using a workflow that lands your faders in a position close to zero will give you more precise control over your mix. The problem is I feel like many people walked away from that video thinking that the mixing with faders at zero concept was a hard and fast rule of mixing instead of a simple workflow tip when you have the ability to implement it. And I saw several comments of people who were trying to implement this thing on an analog mixer or in other simpler mixing setups and they were really frustrated by the process. So today I want to revisit this topic and provide some additional guidance that I hope will help clear things up and I want to start by explaining the faders at zero concept again for those who didn't see the first video. The underlying principle of this concept is that faders are not linear and here's what I mean. I'm going to show you a photo and this is a really great grainy photo. I apologize for that. This is actually a picture of, of the screen on the Midas console that I mix on right now. But what you'll notice about this fader is that when I have my fader up here close to zero and I make a small movement on that fader, it's only going to make a couple dB of difference. It's going to have a very small volume change. But if I have my fader way down here close to the bottom and I make that same small fader movement, it's actually going to equal a bigger change in volume than when it was up closer to zero. And that's what I mean by the faders are not linear. Depending on where the fader is on the scale, it's going to make different amounts of volume change. Okay, so what this means for us when we're mixing is that if we want to have detailed control over the volume of our channels, mixing in high fader resolution or close to zero makes that possible. But at this point, I feel like I need to stress this again. This concept is a workflow tip. It's not a hard and fast mixing rule that will make or break your mix. We don't live in a perfect world and many times in mixing, our workflows and the way things are laid out on our consoles won't be picture perfect. So in this example, if an input in your mix is too loud, grab the fader and just turn it down. Don't feel the pressure to make every fader sit perfectly at zero across the board at the expense of your mix not sounding balanced. Obviously, that's not what we're going for. But with that said, keeping the faders around zero is a great practice. And when we understand how the faders are designed, this makes perfect sense. But when we mix this way, we do run into some obstacles, as some of you guys have discovered in your own personal experience. So I want to talk about some of these problems and maybe provide some solutions to help you out in your own scenario. So I'm going to open up a Reaper project here. We'll close that out. And you can see here that I've got a bunch of tracks. I've got some drum tracks. I have some guitars, some keys, some vocals. And a couple of the the objections that I got in the comments, first of all, the, the most common one was, you know, if I run my faders at zero, it makes everything too loud in the house. Okay, so what we have here is just a bunch of tracks. Let's say we've optimized our, our fader resolution. Everything is running close to zero. It sounds nice and balanced, but everything is just way too loud. What do we do in this scenario? Okay, the, my solution to this would be to go over to the master because the master controls the mix as a whole and I would pull that master down a little bit. So if your whole mix is too loud, we use the master to turn it down. And this preserves the balance of your input faders while you get them back into a good position closer to zero while maintaining a good level in the room as well. However, if only certain groups of instruments are too loud, so for example, if the drums are too loud, but then everything else is, is a good volume, this is where I would use a subgroup or a bus. And what this allows me to do is, let me show you real quick here, 
if if I close that out, you can see all these drum tracks are, are inside. They're a little bit indented, but they're underneath this drum bus here. And what this allows me to do is I can control the volume of the drum kit as a whole with this one bus fader. Okay, so if my drums are too loud, everything else is at a good volume. I can take this fader, I can pull it down. And there we go, my drums are at a good volume and I've maintained that good fader resolution on my drum inputs. So we've now solved that problem without causing any other issues. The second problem that I heard many people mention was, I'm working on an analog console, I don't have groups, okay? so. With this one, you have to understand that using groups and subgroups is a feature that you often get in um, in more capable digital consoles. So if you're using a smaller analog console, you may not have access to the more complex routing features, and that's okay. So what's kind of the solution? Well, when you're limited by the gear that you have, that's all right, you're still going to be able to make good music, you may just not have as many options of how to optimize everything like you would on a more capable console. So in this scenario, I would take all of my inputs, I'd get them as balanced as well as I could, using the master fader as well to get the volume in the room, the mix as a whole at a good volume, and I'd just do as best as I can with that and not really worry about the rest because at that point you're more limited by the capabilities of the console itself and you can still make good mixes on that. Again, this concept is not going to make or break your mix. It simply gives you more precise control over your inputs whenever you have access to those kinds of features. So if the gear is the limiting factor, then work what you have and still you'll be able to make great music. It'll be all right. So I hope this video will help clear up any confusion around this topic. But if you still have questions, let me know in the comments below. And while you're at it, if you haven't already downloaded my free mixing guide on my website, themixingprocess.com, be sure to go do that. Check that out today before you get started on your next mix. Thanks for watching. Go be great at what you do. I will see you on the next one.